Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. First off, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as a reminder, this is Coalition's monthly security webinar series. And we're excited to be joined uh, by a broad group of our policyholder customers, as well as some broker partners this morning. And today we're gonna to be talking about our new coalition risk assessment. I'm really excited to share this document as this is really the, the culmination of all of the data and information that we use to underwrite and protect our policyholders that's been packaged up in a document that you and your organization can use to understand your own security posture, as well as implement recommendations to make yourself more secure. So we're really excited to share what we've done with this document and, and how you can protect your organization from the security threats and vulnerabilities that we identify. My name is Jen McPhillips and I'm gonna be moderating the conversation this morning. And I'm excited to be joined by two of my colleagues. So first, Sean Ram, who is the head of insurance at Coalition. Sean's been here since the beginning of the company, and he leads all things insurance related from distribution and underwriting uh, all the way through to claims handling and remediation. I'm also joined by Zoltan Williams, who's a security engineer on Coalition's security engineering team. And this is the team that's looking for vulnerabilities and threats that may target our policyholders and, and works in conjunction with our claims and security team to help address those vulnerabilities and make our customers more secure. Just a quick reminder about who we are. Uh, again, you're all here because you are a coalition policyholder and, and we thank you for your partnership and, and support. We're the fastest growing provider of cyber insurance in the US and now in Canada as well. And what's unique about us is that in addition to the comprehensive insurance that we provide, we also offer proactive security monitoring and security tools to help our customers solve cyber risk. And for us, this really means you know end-to-end -end risk management from identifying threats before they target our customers through tools like our coalition risk assessment all the way through to remediation in the event of a claim or a security incident. One quick note before we dive in, I'll, I'll share our, our agenda for this morning and then I'll hand it over to Sean. You should see at the bottom of your screen, two buttons, two icons, one for chat and one for Q&A. We'd encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll also be leaving some time at the end dedicated for questions, but you can submit questions through either one of those two channels, the Q&A or the chat button. So first, we're gonna be talking a little bit about our claims data and claims experience. And this is the information that really sort of underlies how we think about assessing risk and how we think about scanning our policyholders on an ongoing basis. That'll then lead to demonstrating the data that we use in this scan and how we actually package this into our coalition risk assessment to offer tailored recommendations and uh, security, security suggestions for your organization. And then finally, at the end, we'll leave some time open for questions. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Sean. Excellent. It's a pleasure being with you all today um, and have the opportunity just to tell you a little bit about Coalition's claims data and how this information leads into the primary purpose of our conversation today in terms of describing uh, the Coalition risk assessment. So um, the first slide that I'd like to share describes kind of how Coalition thinks about data and about risk. And if I could draw your eyes to the right-hand side of the page, where you can see the coalition, we develop our own policy, we developed a rating model, which charges premium according to the risk of a company, and that enabled us to acquire customers. Now, many of you are aware that coalition, um, we created something we call a signals intelligence platform, which collects information um, publicly available information, we'll spend more time on this, that enables us to collect a tremendous amount of data, enabling you, the policyholder, to not have to fill out large applications, you know, 10, 25 page applications, when a lot of this information is, is available already publicly. Well, all of that data enables us to do some really interesting things. Now, this idea 
of an insurance company acquiring data through an application and publicly available information, and then using that data to improve their underwriting is a pretty like straightforward concept, right? However, if you think about this in the context as an example in the property insurance world, where a building burns to the ground and the insurance company sends a property engineer to the site and does some analysis and understands what happens and what happened in terms of the root cause of the claim. And then sharing that information with underwriting in order to improve the manner in which insurance for property is unwritten, um, that's pretty normal and pretty common. In cyber, it isn't though, right? The feedback loop oftentimes concludes, right? After the customer is acquired and a claim occurred, what most insurance companies do is send the, um, the claim, if you will, when the claim occurs, they send that to a third party, an incident response team. At Coalition, um, where it's better IT and claims response, we have our own incident response team. So our ability to learn around, you know, claims that are occurring around the world and how that may impact our policyholders is something that's really important to us. In addition, we also leverage that data to improve our underwriting. Um, we have an understanding around the types of companies that are hit with various ransomware or other types of claims that may occur. And we translate that information and provide that information to brokers and policyholders to improve our underwriting. The other area that um, I hope you are all aware of is that Coalition also provides a suite of security tools to all policyholders at no cost. This is the idea of actively risk engineering. The concept here is that through the security tooling that Coalition provides, the actual risk profile of a policyholder actually improves as a result of being co as a result of purchasing insurance through a coalition. These three areas, actively providing security tooling or risk engineering, improving underwriting, and the manner in which we go about the claims process enables us to acquire even better data than the general marketplace. Well, better data in insurance leads to better losses. And when losses are lowered, um, that enables us to provide pricing that is superior or even superior coverage, thereby increasing our customers. And then this feedback loop is complete. Um, and that's unique in cyber and enables us to have the data that we're gonna share today uh, in this presentation. On the next slide, I kind of dive into this a little bit, right? Um, our data comes from three primary sources. One is everything that we learn from our policyholders. Um, claim scenarios, um, kind of the security or technologies that we're able to see, all of those types of things. We do have some market data. So the NAIC is the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, and that is each individual state in the United States has a commissioner, and they have data specific to um, the areas of insurance that we write, that we capture as well. And then finally, insurance applications. Uh, many of you are aware who have filled out insurance applications that insurance companies want to know what prior losses you've had. And so we collect that data as well. The primary source of our data is really what we do ourselves. And because we collect so much data, and because the manner in which we underwrite your technology, as well as all of our efforts from a security standpoint, that enables us to provide a very unique uh, data. It, it enables us to provide very unique data complementing the insurance and services you receive from Coalition. So let's dive into that data a little bit. On this next slide, what we, we released a claims report that I hope most of you have. If you haven't, we'd love to send you a copy, but we really claims recently in demonstrating all of the claims and the data that we see from those claims. And somewhat not surprisingly, but some of you may find it interesting that ransomware, funds being fraudulently transferred from an organization and email compromise account for roughly 90% of all of the claims that we've seen. Now, these are claims that are covered from insurance, just to kind of start, uh, but ransomware is a plague in cybersecurity today. 
Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, ransomware is the concept that an adversary has access to a network, um, oftentimes will capture, uh, kind of enter a network and, and monitor what's occurring behind the scenes. They will understand where data is being backed up and then they will basically implement malware, which will encrypt all of the data within an organization. You have situations where someone shows up to work, well, in today's world, and turns on their laptop and they're unable to access anything, any information, email won't work. They, they can't access any files or data, it's all encrypted. And then the adversary is looking for a certain dollar amount, oftentimes, to be paid in the form of cryptocurrency in order to release the data. This is a significant problem in industry and not surprisingly comprises 41% of the claims that we see. Um, funds transfer fraud is the next segment. It's the only other area that I'll talk about because uh, I'll address email on a subsequent slide. But funds transfer fraud is the idea that someone in finance receives um, an invoice to pay a, a vendor a certain amount of money. We've even seen this occur in HR where someone receives an email to change their bank routing information and everything looks right about the email except the individual receiving the email doesn't put forth the extra effort in calling the vendor or calling the individual that requested the bank routing change to confirm, to authenticate either the routing information or that the email was legit. They don't recognize that the routing information is different than the past or whatever it might be. And fraudulently, there are funds transferred to the wrong organization. Now, fortunately, Coalition has had quite a bit of success in recovering these funds, um, but there are times where um, these funds are very difficult to recover. They've already gone through the banking system, gone to foreign entities and adversaries. And then email compromise is the third target. And this is kind of this concept that someone gets access to email and they're able to go into, for example, HR's files and capture things like social security numbers or health related information. We dive into this a bit more deeply on the next slide, where if you kind of think about this, this idea of um, email being accessed through phishing or other areas, here what we're showing is the percentage of claims by the actual technique that the adversary is using. So not surprisingly, 54% of claims that we see in cyber emanate from email or phishing as, a, as the attack vector that's being, the technique that's being utilized. Adversaries want access to email. And because we're so used to opening up and looking through many tens, if not hundreds of emails regularly, it puts us in a position where we might miss the fact that an email is not from the actual sender that it's intended from. Remote access, we've done a variety of webinars of this in the past. Um, this is the concept that I can access my desktop remotely through my own computer, um, through a public facing website um, without any secondary methodology of authentication. So this is the concept that you're able to go to a website, put in your username and password and get access to your desktop, right? Um, because email addresses are easily understood um, in the public domain. It's easy to understand, easy to decipher what someone's email may be. An adversary can look at a site like that and just over a period of months even, just put in millions of password combinations attempting to get access. If that same public access site was available behind a VPN, the adversary wouldn't see it. Or if it had a secondary methodology of authentication, for example, a text, a, a number via text, or even better, um, an authentication application on your phone, uh, that would be tremendously helpful. There's some other areas that we identify here, but you can see if we simply take a look at email, or phishing along with remote access that solves a lot of the problems associated with cyber. So at Coalition, and we can go to the next slide, at Coalition, we looked at these areas and we said, how do we, how do we build and provide information to you that would be beneficial recognizing the claims vectors we see? And that's what I'd like to transition to. And with that, I'd like to, to 
turn it over to Zoltan. Thank you very much, Sean. Before we go uh, much further, I noticed that John had a question. Uh, I know that someone else is supposed to be moderating these, but I just want to answer it really quickly. Um, with so many organizations, people working from home, what steps would you suggest to ensure that people's home computers are adequately protected from cyber attacks on employer information? Uh, John, just to answer that question for you very quickly, the best thing to do is, of course, follow the steps that are set up by your um, organization. If they require you to be on a VPN to access their systems, be on a VPN. Um, work from a specific uh, company-provided laptop, so that way there's no proliferation of data between the two systems. And the very last thing I would also say is to ensure that you don't click on any attachments or anything that are outside of your normal work day. Let's just uh, quickly answer that. So, hi everybody. My name is Zoltan Williams. Uh, I'm the cybersecurity engineer for Coalition, and I'll be talking to you about some of the data that we use. Um, I like to give a very short spiel so that everyone knows that they can ask me as much questions as they want. I did six years in the United States Army. I did five years with the NSA. I did some time uh, doing cybersecurity for the VA in the Midwest of America. I say all that so that you folks know, I don't know anything about insurance. I don't know anything about policies. I only work on cybersecurity and the internet. So please feel free to answer, ask any of these questions. I most likely will have an answer for you. Going into this, um, the data that we are using here, as you can see, there are several members on the security team that have security expertise. So as I said, I'm former NSA. There are members on the team that are former CIA, DOD government workers. And with the company that Coalition has bought, Binary Edge, um, they are actually an internet scale scanning collection and analysis platform. So they scan the entire internet repeatedly throughout the day to gather all these open signals that are out there on the open internet. We, bra we drag all that information in, the data that we collect from Binary Edge and also the security expertise of not only the security team, but the data collection team. And that's how we begin to make some of these models and these risk assessments that we have. While we have this, we look at certain things such as the threat actor, their specific tools, techniques, and platforms that they use. These are known as TPP, ongoing scanning and proactive alerts. So while we scan, we also look for things that might cause O day or zero day vulnerabilities and exploits. And we inform our policyholders about those issues. And of course, risk mitigation and recovery. The risk mitigation factor is oftentimes, very recently, there was the sonic wall zero day vulnerability. Everyone that was on the coalition book, everyone that was insured by us, we scanned all their systems, found the people that had sonic wall, sonic wall firewalls on the front end, and we made them aware of it. And we also told them the proper ways to recover from those issues. Oftentimes we will actually let people know before their service providers that they might have a vulnerability. So while all of this is really good in concept, if we could go over to the next slide, we have a very handy dandy photo here so you can understand. The IP address is kind of like a house. It's identifiable, almost anyone can see your IP address. And the information that we're getting is kind of through the windows and the doors. This allows us to potentially see what's inside or at least what you're presenting, the numbers that are outside of your house. These are the windows, the doors, and the bad actors, the burglars, the evil people on the internet, they are constantly looking for anything that is open, weak, easily broken. And if they're able to, they will actually attempt to exploit it. On the next slide, what you'll see is we will go ahead and once we do, we will look at these the exact same way that the bad actors will look at your homes. So if you're a high risk, moderate risk, or low risk, we will let you know. And hopefully what we will try to do is we'll try to take you from high down to low, moderate down to low. The information that we're providing to you is the exact same information that's open on the internet, anyone can see this information if they're out there looking for it. Next slide, please. And not only are we able to just detect the information that your domain address, your IP address is providing, but we'll actually perform several steps of enumeration with Binary Edge to find the things that are related around it. A lot of companies have what's called trusted networks. So if your corporate H2 speaks to your rental, your retail shop, that's considered a trusted network, and it's oftentimes not as heavily policed or as secure as your front end facing IP address. This is actually very prolific for very large companies or companies that grow too quickly. Their corporate, European, AWS, all of these IP addresses will, in, will uh, natively talk to each other from a very trusted point of view. And what this often means is that if you compromise one, you can compromise the entire network. These are known as flat networks, and these are things that we really try to deter and tell our customers not to have. A flat network can almost always lead to a full, full claim loss. 
And the reason for that is ransomware usually starts out these bad actors. They'll perform their ransomware on one IP address or one system, but if they actually have propagation tools within it. So if it's a flat network, the ransomware will scan the internal network and continue to encrypt as much as it can throughout the entire network. So if your network is not segmented, what will happen is instead of them just co uh, compromising your corporate HQ, they'll take down your corporate HQ, they'll take down your retail shop, they'll take down your home offices, all of these systems will get encrypted at the exact same time. And to further talk about how bad this is, while they're doing this encryption, they'll actually for all of those IP address, put backdoor IP addresses that are, they're able to access. Usually this is a reverse firewall, and they'll actually know the IP address and the port number and they'll be able to connect to it. So before we go on and I'm getting ready to do the demo portion, um, I just wanted to know if there were any more questions. I'm not looking at the chat at the moment. Yeah, Zoltan, there was one question that came in about how we actually scan or assess our policyholders attack surface. Uh, can we, we can talk about that in more detail as well in the CRA demo, but maybe you can talk a little bit about what that process is and how we identify that data. Sure, um, I can talk about it while I swap over to the CRA, if that's okay. Sounds great. Cool. Hey, Jen, just to contextualize that, I, th I think the question is, how do we know what their attack surface is? Um, and specifically asking if they need to report their public facing endpoints. Just for context, Zoltan, I think that may help. Awesome. So they do not need to report their public facing endpoints because we will provide that information to them. And all they need to do is either confirm or deny what we found. So the companies, what ends up happening here, and Coalition actually does something really cool that my other jobs never did. Once you submit your domain, the domain that you submit is already attached to what's called an A record. From your A records, we're actually able to find other things such as your name server, your mail exchange server, and we're also able to find your service provider if it is not self-hosted. From there, we'll begin an enumeration process where the very first thing we'll do is we'll pull the list of all other A records registered to that corporate entity. There are several other tools and special secret sauce in the background that Coalition does, but once we have a domain address or even an email address that you've already confirmed and given to us, we'll go ahead and we'll pop out this huge list of all of the domains, IP addresses, and systems we believe are owned by you. And with that, we'll go ahead and we'll start scanning. Your attack surface does not only just depend on that, but your attack surface actually depends on that as long with the vulnerabilities and systems that are actually readable to the open internet. Things that are hidden behind VPNs, things that are hidden behind firewalls, things that require 2FA to log into would not be considered a part of your external attack surface. It would be considered part of your internal attack surface. While it would be very helpful for you to report your public facing endpoints, I would say that Coalition does a very good job of finding these naturally. And if we provide this list to you of our IP addresses that we scanned and you don't see one on there that you believe should be, I would recommend you let either the security engineer or the broker know and we'll go ahead and we'll try and find it out. So with that, that answered. Yeah. On that point, can you actually talk a little bit about our enumeration process? Because there's another question that came in about how we find related domains. And mm -hmm. so maybe that might address as well how, how we use through our enumeration process, um, how we identify those related domains for our customers. Am I allowed to am I allowed to really go off the rails and do a live presentation? I can show an open source tool, and I think it's pretty cool. Let's do it. Awesome. So um, this, none of this is planned, so I apologize in advance. So we're going to pick a random company here uh, that I just so happen to have saved in one of my bars. And this website's called dnsdumpster.com. If you go onto a website like dnsdumpster.com and just type in this email address or uh, this uh, URL, and you scroll down, the first thing you'll find here is your DNS servers. These two DNS servers are the registered servers that are allowed to tell the entire world who really owns that website. Underneath there is your MX records, your mail exchange records. And as it says here, this is where emails go. So when someone sends an email to this company, it gets uh, given proof here and sent further off. These are your SPF records. Your SPF record says who is allowed to send emails on your behalf. If you don't have an SPF record in place, people are actually able to pretend to send an email from you to someone else. And then down here, we have host records. So I put in the email address, remember at the beginning, this one right here, realty.com. And doing that, I got three, four other websites. So I got their FTP, mail, their remote website, and another remote website. 
going down here further, and I'll zoom in just a little bit, this is a natural flow of it. So binary edge does not only this, but much more. What we'll also do is we'll actually pull out the um, registrar records, the RIR records, and we'll see the person that registered it. And we'll use some uh, actual intel within there to see if it's a unique person. So, so long as it's not registered at GoDaddy. And we'll try to find other websites that are in the same industry and registered with the same uh, person on it. There are several other steps. I don't think I'm at liberty to discuss those. I would actually have to talk with legal and other people. But this is a high level way of seeing that. So, um, are there more questions or shall I continue to the CRA? Let's continue with the CRA and we'll, we'll go through questions throughout. Awesome. So um, the CRA that we've decided to use today for you is appleinc.com. Um, this is a small little company. You might not have heard of them. So going down here, what the CRA does, it gives a very high level um, scanning, potential claims loss, vulnerabilities that we see on this. And the reason the CRA is so cool, at least for me, is it's something really good to provide to executives and people that are both technologically savvy and not so technologically savvy. Um, we can dig into some details here on how deep we'd like to go. But at the very top, the company is apple.com. This is the revenue that we expect. This is how much uh, PHI or PII that we see on it. This is employee information. Um, some of this information might be dummy information for the sake of this. Obviously, Apple has more than 12 uh, customers. So going down here, these are our vulnerabilities. You can see two critical, three high, 4,541 medium, 6,000 plus low risk. The domains that we found, the IP addresses, the applications, the services, and the hosting. Um, domains are obviously the websites, the IP addresses, are IPs that go with them. The applications are the actual systems that are serving up all of the information. The services are the actual network level services. These are things like SSH and FTP. And the hosting is the hosting provider or the different places that it is hosted. Here are your vulnerabilities by category, RDP, IoT, encryption, malware, SSL, web, and storage. Um, if any of these terms, I understand some of this is jargon. If you don't know what these are, you can ask in the chat and I will answer them quickly, or you could also Google them, um, but it's not a big deal. This is relatively new. Um, Sean, I don't know if you'd like to step in and talk about this, but this is the um, uh, uh, yeah. claims calculator being used in effect here. Happy to do that. Zoltan, would you mind just like increasing, um, like zooming in, zooming in a bit? Thank you. So we mentioned how um, the vast majority of claims that we see are focused on ransomware and on funds transfers, funds being fraudulently transferred, as well as email being compromised. Many of you have seen claims related calculators in the past, and most of the claims calculators in the cyber industry have been focused on data breach. Now data breach still occurs today. There are credit cards that are compromised, personally, identif personally identifiable information or health information that are leaked. Um, and that's that still remains a problem. However, the, the vast majority of the problem is around ransomware and around funds being fraudulently transferred. So what we did at Coalition is we took all of the information, the claims related information we have, um, and we created a calculator to help you determine what is the probable maximum loss event you could have in certain intervals. So what you're seeing here embedded into our coalition risk assessment is, a calcul is an actual analysis around the claims as per the security that we see in this case specific to Apple. Right. So we say we show first the incident likelihood compared to an average coalition insured. We, we're giving you some benchmarking regarding the amount of limits that are being purchased. Now, this is focused on the revenue that was inputted here, which I think was about $20 million. But then, as you can see in the chart below, we're now showing you the estimated cost based upon your particular risk, specifically in regards to ransomware, funds transfer fraud, and data breach. So we're showing you the median loss. And then for those of you that have purchased natural catastrophe type coverage, for example, earthquake or flood, windstorm type coverage, you're used to this analysis where the manner in which a loss scenario is portrayed is in light of a one in X number of year event. Oftentimes in property, it's one in 200 year to one in 1000 year event. 
Well, cyber, we don't have statistical integrity to get up to a one in 1,000 year event. And frankly, most don't really care. But we do believe, based upon our data, that there is integrity around a one in 10 year loss event or a one in 100 year loss event. And so the chart at the top right can help you as a policyholder determine, hey, what are other companies like me purchasing? But the chart at the bottom can help you kind of correlate that information into what are the loss events that I'm trying to protect against, right? And some of you may have a loss or risk appetite more in line with a one in 100 year loss event. Some are, you know, less, or I'll use the term less conservative, right? And so maybe you're more focused on the one in 10 year loss event. Um, and many of you are somewhere in between, right? Not a big deal, but only you understand your risk appetite in conjunction with the counsel from your broker. But now what we're doing is we're providing you some data to help you make that decision around what are the risks that you're able to bear or retain as a company? And what is the really the, the function of the limit that you're looking to purchase in accordance with your risk appetite uh, that you're not willing to bear? Um, so hopefully that gives you some insight. Um, again, happy to entertain questions about any of this. Um, but with that, Zoltan, I'll turn it back to you. Awesome. Thank you, as always, for the great answer, because I didn't know any of that. So coming down here, uh, we're going to run through these relatively quickly, just because it's mostly jargon. And uh, if you have more questions about it, please do feel free to ask. These are the issues that we found with the email security of the website. So we saw DMARC and SPF are both fails. This essentially means that it is possible for someone to spoof an email address and send it off on behalf of the company as if it was them. Of course, if we saw this and you have things such as a real estate company, a claims company, um, a business to business primarily company, we would strongly recommend that you have SPNF, SPF enabled. The reason being obviously is you don't want an email from your primary client going out and saying, please change my bank account or something to that nature, and they just do it. So it's very important that you have one or if possible, both of these enabled. Going down, we have vulnerabilities. These are web application security vulnerabilities. This is a relatively high profile area of attacks, especially on the front end. Uh, here we see that the customer is missing XXSS, this stands for cross-site scripting protection on the header. These are the websites that are missing it. These websites oftentimes can correlate into a, dom a domain address. Uh, going down further, we have directory listing vulnerability. That means on these websites, we're actually able to list all of the resources that are on those web pages. On to the next one, we have HTTP cookies without the secure flag enabled. What this means is that someone, if they were able to get access to your system, or if they were able to do a um, man in the middle attack, could steal your cookies and modify them going forward. The reason this is a big issue is everyone here has been on a bank's website. If you log off and log back into a bank's website within two minutes, the bank does not require you to re-input your credentials or your validation. Obviously on other websites, this is a much longer time frame. If you, are, if you do not have the secure flag on and you attempt to do this again, the bank, which should have secure flags, will say, your cookies do not match, you're not the right person, re-enter your creds. But if those cookies do not have the secure flag on it, it would accept your session and allow you to go on there and continue to make modifications. That's something we don't want to happen. These are HTTP cookie with HTTP only flags. This means that you're not able to um, force HTTP to HTTPS, which means that your information could possibly be stolen. Um, going down further, we have HTTP maximum age or expires. Basically, just this just means that we want people to um, actually have a, the cookies to expire, expire eventually, so that way we're able to issue you new ones, and there's not the possibility of someone doing a man-in-the-middle attack. Next, we're off to services. IoT means the Internet of Device, Internet of Things or Internet of Devices were found here. This just means that a relatively poorly configured tool was detected. Um, IoT devices generally don't have the strongest security presence in mind because IoT is still somewhat in its infancy. These are just created to work. Uh, oftentimes, IoT doesn't have secure login. It doesn't, and, and because it's not supposed to. You, if you're going to have a light bulb that listens to you, you can't put in your password every time you want to uh, turn it on or off. So, this shows you where these systems are found and what they're missing. 
going on to the next one, we have our biggest issue usually found is possible RDP open. RDP stands for Remote Desktop Protocol. RDP is the um, easiest way currently to hack a public facing system. The reason for this is because of Edward Snowden and the Snowden leaks and the NSA. There are several exploits out there, usually a tonal blue, uh, blue keep that allow you to completely destroy RDP. While there are several mitigating factors that you can have on these systems, we do not recommend RDP to be used. RDP is oftentimes used for all sorts of hacking, nefarious activities. Um, it's much better to use a site-to-site -site VPN, use something like a Checkpoint or Palo Alto. Um, but if you have RDP on here, it's a very big issue and it should not be used. Going down further, we see potential technology affected. This is an F5. Um, F5s are what are called load balancers. Oftentimes, these vulnerabilities are, in my opinion, a false positive or a slight misconfiguration. Uh, it doesn't lead to a huge issue, which is why it's not a critical. But if this is a true positive, it is a very big deal. F5s gather all the information that are coming to your system and distributes them back out. F5s are considered trusted technologies by every system in the world. And if one gets compromised, it can be a lot of data leakage and a lot of man in the middle attacks. SNMP is a simple network management protocol. I always call it simple network mapping. It essentially does the same thing. It's used to manage uh, devices that are on your network. If SNMP is on the front end, it's possible that your UDP packets could be um, misconfigured and people can change the timing between it. Once again, it is a big issue, but one that's not seen very often, but we do recommend that um, it is not exposed to the public facing because it really shouldn't be. Going down, we have one that leads to a lot of discussion, which is expired certificates. If any of you have ever gone onto a website and it says, this website's not safe, click advance to accept to go on and accept the risk, this is usually the reason. The big issue with this is that we do not want people getting into the habit of not reading that warning and just clicking yes and going forward. If the certificate is expired, if the certificate doesn't match, this allows a hacker to do what's called a watering hole attack, where if the hacker was actually able to compromise your website and serve up their own fake certificate and someone clicks yes and goes onto it, the hacker now has them able to click anything on the website. We want when people see an expired certificate for them to take a moment, read what the issue is, and if possible, inform their IT provider, their ISP or their security person at the company to fix this issue. So this will tell you all the places we found expired certificates and you can go ahead and you can look into the reason for why they might be expired. Going down, this is IP and domain reputation. We'll be able to tell you if your website has been blacklisted on the open internet. Basically just means that uh, you've been reported to places like VirusTotal or even GoDaddy, and they will start to uh, proliferate that block, block list and put you on certain lists. Um, this can be a bad, not only for reputation, but your inability to actually do work. If you get onto the Google blacklist, Google Chrome will actually stop other people from going to your website. It will just not allow it, period, dot, until you're removed. Honeypot events is us being able to see an increase of traffic from your network going outbound to places that it shouldn't be. We will call these honeypot events. And of course, malware. Um, one of the cool things that Coalition does is we actually go onto the dark web and we'll find, um, we'll buy malware signals from some of these bad actors. We don't pay, buy it from them directly. There are several services that provide it to us. And with this, we'll actually see if your company's list is on any of these lists serving up malware from your systems to other people. So if we find that, you should not be doing that, and we'll work with you to fix that issue. This says access associated um, with malware. Of course, these are loop back addresses and fake IP addresses. So, uh, But if we do find something that is associated with malware, we will tell you so you can go ahead and resolve the issue. Going further, assets associated with spam or even malicious events. Going down further, these are your DNS systems. These are the A records that we scanned. So when we were asked of enumeration, currently we're displaying 10 of the 7,723 domains that were found. These are your quad A records, A records with the IPv6. These are them further. If you know anything about IPv6, then they probably shouldn't look like this, but they are quad A, so it's not going to be all the numbers and double punctuations. Your C name records, your mail exchange records, your NAP, your NAPTR records, um, and here are your name servers, SOA records, text records that we were able to find, sensitive information that was exposed. 
going here, this gives you a quick rundown of where your data might have been leaked and reported to um, the public internet. So Cloudfire, Mathway, Facebook profiles, these all had leaks. And these, this leaked data was on places such as have I been pwned? And we're able to pull that out there using the subdomain to go ahead and tell you where this information might be located. And so before yes. we move on from the, the leaked data sure. and credentials, there was a question that came in about reporting requirements and whether companies are required to report data breaches in all situations or whether that's just in a scenario where PII was exposed. And Sean, would love if you could answer that for this group. Happy to do that. I, I think I did um, respond in the chat as well. But each individual state has a has requirements around reporting, um, and so I'm, I'm not I'm not looking to provide any legal advice here. But the um, states have different requirements around. Hey, if a certain uh, well, first of all, states identify what person identify information is in a unique fashion, right? So one state may be different from another state. In addition, like the, the quantity of information, the one state might say, hey, name and social security number, if it's not um, encrypted and, and if uh, there's a number that's lost, say, you know, 50 records or 50,000 records, um, one state may have that as a requirement. Another state may have a requirement where they're gonna identify name and address. Right, um, with phone number as an example. Again, if it's not encrypted, that's something that they're gonna draw attention to. And so I would definitely work with legal staff and um, internal and outside counsel in order to determine your, where you have customer information, or it doesn't have to be customer, but just PII or PHI, um, where you have information stored, where those individuals live, um, and then also be sensitive that the, that the regulatory requirements that I'm commenting on now extend beyond the US and you also have um, kind of major regulations in other geographies, for example, GDPR or the Australian Privacy Directive or whatever it might be. And so it depends on what information you have, how it's collected, how it's encrypted and what regulation in order to to really understand it. Uh, there's some complexity there. So having, having some advice from an expert is useful. Awesome. So, um, and essentially with that, that is the end of this report. Further down, you'll just see the leaked data by year. And after that, it's a discussion about password quality and then just, you know, what is cyber insurance? Um, I don't have much more to say on the CRA would this be the time to continue with Q&A? Yeah, and we've had a few more questions come in. Awesome. And one of the first ones I'd like to start with is about antivirus. Uh, and the specific question is, you know, whether we have recommendations for using an integrated product like Windows Defender that's part of the, the Windows package of, of tools or something off the shelf like a Norton or McAfee that's you know, more purpose-built for that. So Zoltan, would love your, your thoughts and recommendations on how people should think about antivirus. Awesome. So to answer that question explicitly, if you can, I would recommend that you speak with your company about possibly setting up a VM. So a VM allows you to have an entire other network on your own computer, and you could do your work from the VM to ensure that there's no big issues. But to get into it explicitly, Windows Defender is really, really good. Windows has done a bang up job of making it work really well on PCs. And I do recommend that you use it if possible. Um, another one that is good is Malwarebytes. I stand by it and I think it's very good as well. Um, but Windows Defender is very good. I don't think there's any issues using it. And I think more people should, especially if you don't wanna have to uh, do too much of your own configurations. Thank you. Um, another question came in about password management and wondering if you can share some specific recommendations around how we, uh, how we approach password management and any specific providers that you would recommend. So for personal password management, I use uh, KeepPass. LastPass is also good. Um, I'm not sure what coalition the organization says as their answer, but for me as a security guy, I do like LastPass, KeepPass, and I do recommend you use them. Um, I'm a former army guy, so apologies, but if you held a gun to my head and asked me for my passwords, I couldn't give you any. I don't know any of my passwords. So 
uh, yeah, I think it's really, really good. Yeah, and just internally, we use one password, but a lot of the ones that are on the marketplace and that Zoltan mentioned are you know, very similar in terms of functionality. One other benefit beyond having it be a, a secure way to store individual passwords is team level access. And this is actually something that we do for teams across coalition, um, which is there might be shared passwords for certain providers and you can create shared access in team vaults. So that's another way to manage access across a team, which is especially helpful in the remote working environment. Another question came in about using RDP Gateway with MFA. And uh, do we have any specific recommendations around the performance and cost relationship of, of those products and of using a VPN on top of it? Um, so in my opinion, and this might be one that requires further look um, research. The thing is, I don't know if you really need to use um, RD Gateway over a VPN. If you have a VPN, almost all the VPNs that I know of, the ones that I'm thinking of specifically is Palo Alto Gateway. They allow end-to-end um, -end VPN access, which would essentially allow you to be directly onto your network to work, and the performance is pretty good. Um, I don't have a huge answer for it. I do know that RDP, even though RDP Gateway with MFA is really good, it is still essentially an attack vector. And the biggest issue with that is even if a bad guy finds RDP and RDP does require MFA, some hackers will essentially now take this as a challenge. My biggest thing and what I always recommend is you kind of want to be like a guy dressed in a gray suit on a Saturday night. You don't want anyone to pay attention to you, especially on the public facing internet. So while RDP gateway with MFA might be acceptable, and I don't want to say it is because I don't think so, but I'd have to research more it still might make you a target of opportunity or even someone's pet project to try and break, so. One, one other thing I'll add to that too is, you know, it can be difficult to answer specific questions because every organization's security considerations and, and data protection needs are different. And so one of the things that we offer to all of our policyholders is the ability to meet with coalition's security team and discuss their specific security program if they have uh, more detailed questions. And we'll send out in the follow-up from this webinar some information about how you can book time with our team. But if you have more specific questions, that might be a great way to address those. Um, another a couple questions that have come in about passwords. So one person asked, do we recommend or are we supportive of using the Google save feature to save uh, passwords across their accounts? Is that a secure method for password management? Google will tell you yes, I will tell you no. Um, I, I worked in the NSA, so I'm inherently uh, untrustworthy of all these things. It is fine for the average person, but I would still recommend that you use KeepPass instead or LastPass. Saving passwords, especially on something like Google Chrome, or even to your Google OneDrive. Google is such a huge company and a zero day or an O day or an exploit used against Google um, would essentially just leave all your data out there. I know that they have everyone's data anyway, um, but it's one less thing that they could have and I would recommend you use uh, KeePass or LastPass. Um, but yeah, I, I would not recommend you use it. I do know that other members of the security community would disagree with me. So I'm gonna put a big asterisk and say that this is all opinionated but I would not recommend it. We've had a few questions coming in about how people can access this report. And Sean, I'm wondering if you can talk to, uh, talk to the policyholder dashboard and how people can access this report on their own and also through their brokers. Sure, so Coalition, um, we actually have this belief that cybersecurity should be democratized. And so we believe that everyone should have access to information associated with cybersecurity at no cost. So there are many companies who um, charge for this type of information. We give it away for free. And so every time a broker submits a company to coalition looking for a quote, we provide them an assessment. Uh, even if we don't quote, we'll provide them this assessment so long as we have the website, right? If someone, if, and most um, certainly coalitions application requests um, kind of what the website of the company is. And so we provide a broker and assessment. So if you received a quote 
or if you've asked your broker to quote, I'm from Coalition and many of you are Coalition policyholders, um, your brokers received this report in the past. We're happy to rerun the report for your broker. So that's the one, one way to get it. The second way is each of you have access to something called your Coalition policyholder dashboard. This dashboard provides you um, kind of marketing material, access to the security tools that, um, that we've discussed today. It also gives you access to the report. So that is available to you on your, on, um, at your own discretion as well. However, um, maybe you forgot the password and speaking of passwords, maybe you're just not really interested in logging into another tool. Um, you are welcome to simply send an email to help at coalitioninc.com. Um, so pretty simple, help at coalitioninc.com. And we'll happily send you your uh, report uh, via email. So multiple ways to get it. Happy to give you as much information as we can in order to help you improve your cybersecurity. Coalition, as you can tell, is more than an insurance company. And we stand ready to support you um, in terms of giving you guidance and support regarding your cybersecurity needs. On that point, we actually just got another great question in about security training. And I think this is really important because you know, we covered a lot of a lot of different topics today. And obviously, cybersecurity is a complex topic and it's constantly evolving. Um, and we had a question about how we would suggest offering training to our policyholders, teammates, and um, and customers in order to know what to look for in cybersecurity. And we actually have a partnership with a company called Curricula that does cybersecurity training and specifically phishing training. And the great thing about this is that one, as coalition policyholder, we've negotiated discounts for all coalition policyholders to implement curricula training across their organization. I believe that the first 15 seats are free and then beyond that there's a 20% discount for all future licenses, but we encourage the use of curricula or other common training providers like know before. Uh, any of those are great solutions and options to help educate your broader team about how to keep your company secure. We've got one last question uh, that Zoltan would be great to get your perspective on is, are there any specific VPN uh, options or providers that we recommend to our policyholders? So for any recommendations for an enterprise level, I would say to speak with your IT staff. Obviously, of course, there's a open VPN, which I think is really cool. I do recommend using a VPN, but to also understand kind of the point of a VPN, um, if you are someplace and you don't trust that the information being sent is secure, use a VPN. If you're accessing sensitive information, you should use a VPN. Um, but some of these things that I have seen parroted online, which is like use a VPN so you could watch different shows on Netflix. I don't think that's a good use for a VPN, but I see why people do it. But yes, I recommend open VPN and um, anything other than that, I would say you need to speak with your IT team and they can provide you a list of things that would be applicable for your organization. And on that point, question about whether OpenVPN logs IPs. And um, there's a, a question about whether ProtonVPN doesn't log IPs anymore. Um, the first thing I'll say is everyone can make statements, but the, only the people that actually control the data center and the protocol really knows the answers. Um, and until there's an actual report justified by a third party, I don't believe any of those things. ProtonVPN does claim that they don't log IP addresses, which is good. OpenVPN claims that they log the IP addresses only for troubleshooting and rerouting of data. Um, OpenVPN's kind of been a known commodity for a lot of years. It's a trusted resource and it's good to use, but ProtonVPN's fine as well. I don't have anything bad to say about them. So yeah, it's possible, um, but this is, in my opinion, this is just what their marketing is saying, um, so. Great. Well, I know that we are coming up against time, so I think we can probably wrap there. But I want to thank everybody for spending time with us, learning more about this topic. And I hope that you walk away knowing a little bit more, not only about the resources that you get as a coalition policyholder, but also about how to make your organization more secure. And you know, I mentioned this earlier, but we'll be sending a follow-up to this 
presentation, not only with the recording, but also with some helpful links uh, to information about how you can implement some of these recommendations, as well as a link to schedule time with coalition's security team in case you want to talk about your specific security program or specific questions. So thank you for uh, spending time with us this morning and I hope you have a great rest of your day.